Welcome, church family online. We're so glad to have you with us today. We uh, always look forward to coming into your home, wherever you stop and take time to listen. This morning in our early service at my other church, someone who only gets out about once a month said, I watch you every week that I'm not at work or at church, that I can tune you in later when I get home. So anyway, we, we welcome you. It's a delight to have you. We're going to sing a little chorus here in Harmony. Um, and by the way, here at Harmony, our church family comes every other week. We, I thought of it this morning. We haven't mentioned, I don't think, online. But um, we are only at allowed 50% capacity. So we're still under CDC regulations. So that had to split our Harmony congregation. So uh, today is the N to Z congregation. And Next week will be the A to M. So I'm, I'm looking for the day when we can bring our whole church family back together. And all of you online, you can come join us. Um, we get these masks off and get these shots in or whatever has to be done. But um, that day is coming, I pray, when we can fill this place again and shout praises to the Lord. There's a little chorus we're going to sing this morning. If you were online as you are with us, and you may know it or may not, but uh, three simple little phrases. Be still and know that I am God. I am the Lord that healeth thee. We've just prayed that kind of prayer this morning. And in thee, O Lord, I put my trust. Sing it with us if you know it, and if not, just let it just work its way into your spirit this morning. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord that healeth thee. In Thee, O Lord, I put my trust. In Thee, O Lord, I put my trust. In Thee, O Lord, I put my trust. 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're in a series, um, I'm not usually a kind of a long series preacher, um, I could spend three months with this topic, methinks that there might be some that says three weeks is plenty, Pastor, move on, so uh, I've been struggling a little bit internally, frankly, with trying to sense the Spirit's leading, because I want to do what He wants. But I can't leave you halfway. And we've started, as you see behind me, hopefully, the three signposts, the uh, rapture, the tribulation, and the second coming. I think we have fairly well covered the uh, rapture. We're gonna just pick up, maybe just tag onto that. Today, my focus is primarily on the tribulation leading into the second coming. Now, all of this comes under the umbrella of the subject of eschatology, which is the study of last days or end times. And so eschatological doctrines um, are fairly unified in the evangelical church. However, I'm quick to suggest to you, as I did last week, that uh, not everyone agrees, especially in terms of tribulation, about where uh, the rapture occurs in relationship to tribulation. Is it pre? Is it mid? Is it post? Uh, I personally believe that the, the Word of God is 
very strongly affirmative that uh, there is a pre-tribulation rapture that we are taken out of here before the tribulation period sets in. But, and, and God gives us a number of signs. I mentioned, of course, the days of Noah. He spared Noah and put him in the ark with Lot. He allowed him to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah before fire rained down. God gives us a number of signs about what these last days are and what we can be looking for. Um, I, I know it's probably a, a, a rather mundane illustration, but um, if, if, I were gonna, if I were gonna leave Easton and I wanted to make a trip to Philadelphia, I have a couple of options, I can, and I've used this before, but I can go over to, to Harrington and then go over to Route 1 if I want or take 13 North to Dover and get on 95, Route 1 up to 95 at Christiana Mall and then go straight into Philly. Or I, could, I can go kind of the back way and go over 213 and come in around Elkton and pick up, pick up uh, 95 and come in from the north side. But however, however in whatever direction I take, there are going to be signs along the way. When I leave Easton, whether I get to Dover or I go up to Elkton and go some, somewhere at certain intervals, there will be signs. Philadelphia, 60 miles. Philadelphia, 40 miles. When I get to Chester, Pennsylvania, it's going to say Philadelphia, 10 miles. And I'm going to go right past the airport if I'm going in the Schoolkill Expressway. Now, the reason I'm saying that is I'm not left in doubt from the time I leave here until I get to Philadelphia about how far it's going to be. There are signs. And the signs are to inform me, to educate me, and also to warn me so that I don't end up in New York City. Are you with me, church? So in the, in the same regard, in no less regard, does God give us signs that are clear, biblically sound, and help us to know that we are approaching these three cataclysmic events. And they are cataclysmic. Believe me, the rapture is going to be a cataclysmic event. Just as the flood was a cataclysmic event, when God spoke to Noah and said, take 120 years and build a, a barge, and he did, and put him on it and shut the door. And all of creation at that point, only eight people survived. Some suggest there were two million alive at that time. Now, I, I've been asked the question, I'm constantly asked the question, as you are as a believer, when you share, well, how could God do that? God didn't do that. Man did that. They brought it on themselves because they refused to believe God. They refused to obey God. They defied what God said. And we are living in the 21st century of defiance and laughing and mocking at our God. And God is not only mercy, but God is justice. Sin reaps consequences. The wages of sin is death. So God would only be fair to his son and to us in bringing judgment on sin or he allowed his son to die in vain. He bore our punishment on Calvary. It cost God everything to provide an access for us so that we could go to be with him and spend eternity with him in heaven forever. It cost him everything. It's very, it's very clear in the Word of God. God never, ever has nor ever will send anyone to hell. God does not. Hell was really created for Satan and the fallen angels, one-third of the angels that he took with him. And the Bible makes it clear that because of man's sin and man's choices, hell has to be enlarged. Hmm. All right. 2 Timothy 3, you may as well know this too, Timothy, that in the last days, it is going to be very difficult to be a Christian. We're feeling that, aren't we? 
For people will love only themselves and their money. Who? what a God that is in our society today. Status, prestige, and money. People are selling out everything, including their morality, for money. They will be proud and boastful, sneering at God, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, thoroughly bad. They will be hard-headed, never give in to others, constant liars and troublemakers, and will think nothing of immorality. They will be rough and cruel and sneer at those who try to do good. You run into that recently? See, you are truth. I want to stop just to interject this. Light cannot, light dispels darkness. Darkness cannot deal with light. You are light. You are the light of the world. Jesus is light. You are truth. And where truth interacts with lies, it cannot stand truth. Whether it's in principle or in principalities, which we're living in right now. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. We are not subject, I said it to you earlier, we are not subject to his authority, but we are living as, with, as, as if there is, and there truly is, a cloud above us where Satan is in control with his demonic forces of the first layer or first kingdom over us. That's why in, in, in the case of Daniel, for instance, when he prayed, he, he, he prayed and he had to wait 21 days for his prayer to be answered for Gabriel to get to him because he said, I had to fight through the demonic forces in the air to get to you. Are you hearing me, church? He didn't say it's going to be pie. In the, listen, I grew up in the pie in the sky generation. I grew up in the 50s. Church was wonderful, everybody loved everybody. We all were a hunky-dory ride. You got saved and you got on a magic carpet and rode on off to heaven. Never had to face a problem in the world. God help us. What a false religion that is. We destroyed two generations by putting all kinds of restrictions on them that were legalistic and never offered them the joy of Jesus. God forgive us. They will betray their friends. They will be hot-headed, puffed up with pride, prefer, listen to this. I wonder if he's writing to the world or the church here. And prefer good times to worshiping God. Well, we, he tells us in the next verse, okay? They will go to church. Really? Timothy, are you... Paul, are you sure? Are you writing to Timothy? Are, are you sure about that? They will go to church, yes, but they won't really believe anything they hear. Don't be taken in by people like that. Over in chapter 4, now, and then we'll move, move quickly ahead. Chapter 4, verse 3, For there is going to come a time when people will not listen to the truth. Wow, what a description of our day. They will not listen to the truth, but will go around looking for teachers who will tell them just what they want to hear. Pleasing them, teachers pleasing their itching ears, satisfying their, their human instincts, befriending them to make them feel as if, oh, God is so good. He's just a goody grandfather. He's Santa Claus, and he's got a master card. You just plug it in, cash in, take out what you want, anytime you want. God owes you. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It costs God everything for us to be here today to hear this word. People won't listen to the truth, but will go around looking for teachers who tell them just what they want to hear. They won't listen to what the Bible says, but will blithely follow their own misguided ideas. Stand ready, church, and don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Whew. I don't know about you, but that, that lights my fire. Mm. 
I just want to give you a quick over, quick overview this morning. I, I know I say that all the time, but um, I, you know, we started with the rapture, and I, I want to concentrate as much as I can with time we have today on the tribulation. Um, I want to preface what I'm saying today. Because this is both for you here and those that are watching online, because many of those online are not uh, attenders of the church regularly, and they don't know the, the names that I'm going to share. They they have no idea where this material comes from. But I want you to know, and I want them to know, that this, this is not a Dave Griffin message, and these are not Dave Griffin ideas. But I, I, I am, I'm still new at this. I've only been doing this 55 years, and I'm still new at this, so I need a lot of help. And I, I just want to read some names of, of those who are, are mentors that, that I seek, seek out their understanding about things like this very subject, the last days. Uh, let me just read through some names. Chuck Swindoll, Dr. John Wolford, who teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary, Dr. Ed Hinson, who teaches at Liberty, John Ankerberg, Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost, Pastor John Lindell, Pastor Dr. David Jeremiah, Pastor Dr. Jimmy Evans, Pastor John MacArthur, Pastor Dr. Michael Easley, who pastors Moody Church, Perry Stone, and I could go on and on with, with many, many others, Robert Morris, um, Jensen Franklin, and a, and a lot of others. They're, they're my source people. I, I have commentaries and all of that. I have resources from uh, my own um, Bible college days, men like Dr. Melvin Dieter and Dr. Earl Wilson, both of whom are in heaven today. Uh, but the foundation they laid for me, I have to go back and dig into people that are smarter than I am and come up with ideas that they kind of lay out that are, and quite frankly, again, I'm being very transparent, these are evangelical, fundamental, Wesleyan, evangelical, Arminian doctrines that they adhere to. And that's my position. So it's easy for me to draw from them. Does that a little, a little explanation? Just because just, I want you to know, what, what, you know what's out there. How, how, how do I come to, to the things that I talk to you about? Now we know that in the last days, and, and as we dealt with the rapture, we know a couple things about the rapture, obviously. Um, I ran this through uh, last week and the week before, but uh, just again for your, for your own um, understanding or re repetitiveness or for those who haven't heard, the rapture is the coming of Christ in the air. The rapture is Christ coming for his saints. The rapture is believers departing the earth. The rapture is Christ claiming his bride. The rapture is Christ gathering his own. The rapture is Christ coming to reward. The rapture is imminent. That means there are no signs preceding the rapture. The rapture is a time of blessing and comfort. Now, let me stop right there. When you look up here at, at, to behind me, uh, and the rapture is, is to your... to right here to my right and your left. Um, the, the rapture is the first major event, the, the, ne the next major event on the calendar of God. That, that is affirmed by the Bible, by, by writers and scholars, by uh, their 12 that I just read you, that all are unified in their belief that the rapture occurs and the church will be gathered out before the tribulation. Now, not all Christians believe that. That's okay. But I'm just telling you that I'm a pre-trib in my, in my basic doctrinal position on, on the coming of Christ. Um, the rapture is, it, 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 Paul says, I use this scripture a lot at funerals, Paul says, in a moment, in the twinkling of time, at the last trump, the trumpet will sound, the dead shall be raised, and we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. That's rapore in the Latin. We shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. He's not coming back to earth. He's coming to gather us away. We shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're not going up and coming right back. We're going to be with Him. We're going to be at home. 
Uh, the, an illustration that why I forget one of these uh, res research persons that I drew from in the last couple of months actually uh, preparing for this. Um, he gave an illustration. I, I kind of liked it. This, this won't work, but this is a little magnet. But if I took a cup and I filled it with wood chips and glass and plastic and then I had gone to the hardware store and I had, a, I had a whole handful of screws and nuts and bolts and I put them all in a bowl. And then I took this big huge magnet. I've seen one like, I don't know if you, they still have them, but we used to have one like a horseshoe. It's great big and it was strong. I mean it would, if you took that bowl and you waved that horseshoe magnet over that bowl, what's gonna happen? All the metal is going to go boom. The magnetic, the magnetic pull, the field of magnetism that draws together is going to bring that out of that bowl to unite with that source of strength. That's the church. That's the rapture. Does that help you? What's left behind? That which was not ready. Jesus is that magnet. The Lord is coming in the clouds, in the air, and drawing out his church. And we're going to rise to meet him in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. I mean, it's done. The blink of an eye, I'm told scientifically, is one fortieth of a second. You're not going to have time to get ready for it. You better be ready now. I believe firmly we're the generation. There's going to be a generation alive when he comes. I don't care if they said it 50 years ago. If they did, we're 50 years closer. And if it doesn't happen for 50 more years, it'll be 50 years down the road and we'll all be gone and with him through death. But I believe we'll be in that generation. I want to be. I want to be in that generation when suddenly He's going to take us out of here. He's going to take the church globally, not just the United States. There are presently 8 billion people on planet Earth. I don't know how many of those. The estimates I hear are 1 billion plus that are truly evangelical believers. Just take 1 or 2 billion, if it's 25%, whatever, and take them out of the Earth in a moment, instantaneously. We're gone. Now that sets up, oh, we could, I could spend a long time with this. I'll try not to do so, but just to give you some highlights. But the, that sets up a period called tribulation. I, it, my reluctance is, I, I, it, it pains me to even talk about it. The period of tribulation is divided, as you know, most of you know. It's a seven-year period. It's the final seven years of the 490 years it was prophesied by Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and several of the other prophets, uh, Malachi. But there, in, in Israel's Judaic history, they had a 490-year calendar. By the way, one of, one of the things, I, I didn't bring this up last week, just, just a little aside. One of the things that Antichrist does is change the calendar and change time. Do you know why? Because what's B.C.? Before Christ. What's A.D.? Some think after death. No, it's Anno Domini, the year of the Lord. Because see, if it was after death, then you've got a 33 and a half year period that's unaccounted for. The life of Christ. Now, I'm saying that because we need to understand that Satan is not happy about that. We're living in the year of the Lord. He wants us to be living in the year of Antichrist. So he changes the calendar. That's one reason we know he's a dictator, he's a denier, he's a, he's a deceiver, he's a liar, he's a loser. And he comes with a false peace to set up his kingdom. Now, the first... The, the first half of tribulation, it, it's divided into three and a half year segments. Okay? 1260 days. 
three and a half years. The first half of the, of the tribulation period is a period where Antichrist, in order for him to take over, he has to deceive Israel. Right now, right now, we, we've been making decisions and we are making decisions globally right now that is setting the platform for the Antichrist to step up and take over. I ventured a couple weeks ago to you that I'm not going to name him. I don't know him, name him. The Bible doesn't name him. I've heard, obviously, growing up that it was the Pope, and then it was, it was Henry Kissinger, and then it was Ronald Reagan, and then it was Bill Clinton, and oh, I mean, everything you could name. And uh, I mentioned to you two weeks ago, I think, that uh, if there's a likely religious figure, it will be the leader of Islam, of which there are two billion adherents, and they are waiting for their Messiah, the 12th Imam, who will become their Messiah, to whom Jesus is loyal, according to them. Jesus is only his prophet. He denounces all Christianity. Now, the first three and a half years of this tribulation period, it, 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 the best way Jesus describes it, and you, you can go back to Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, um, John 20 and 21, Revelation chapters 5 through 18. They'll all give you a foundation on, on the tribulation period. Okay? Now, in the tribulation period, this, this world ruler steps up and takes over. He, he creates one economy, one world government, and one religious following. He's a religious leader, he's a political leader, he's an economic leader. All of those are deceptive. He does that by deception. But he brings together seemingly the whole world to bring peace. We, we many, many, th these scholars that I mentioned to you, the, many of them are, I mean, they're well-educated men. A number of these men I mentioned have taught at Dallas, Liberty, and, and other universities and seminaries. One of them has written 70 books on prophecy alone. These are learned men who've studied the Word of God. And to a person, they, they, they believe with all their heart that God is saying, the church is out of here before, the, before tribulation starts. And the tribulation sets up a period of time where Revelation describes it in, in three different distinctive ways. Now follow me. So it's a little, little hard to stay with, but, but follow the transition here. Jesus himself in, in Matthew 24 says, The coming of Christ and the time of tribulation is like birth pains. Okay? Now, in Revelation we are taught that there are three series of seven judgments poured out on the earth. Three series of of seven judgments. There are seven seal judgments, S-E-A-L. Seal judgments are, let me take this, it's not a good illustration, but if this were your marriage certificate or this were the deed to your home or your property, it would, in, in, in Judaic culture, in the day in which Jesus lived and in the Old Testament, it would be wrapped, seven wrappings, and sealed. And no one could break that seal except a family member. Now, Jesus is saying, I am Lord, and I hold the keys of sin, death, hell, and the grave. And the Bible says no one was worthy to step up and break the seal, but Jesus did. And when he did, seven judgments are poured out. Now, they start small. They start somewhat insignificantly, like, a la yeah, ladies, please don't tell we men, we have no clue what it's like to birth a child. Don't even try to tell us. We would never be able to comprehend it. But you know what it feels like to have those birth pains start and then grow in intensity and then grow in time until you're right at the point where you look at your husband and you say, let's get to the hospital. See, there becomes an urgency. 
So this happens with these three sets of seven judgments that are poured out. Seven seals are followed by seven trumpets, are followed by seven bowls, B-O-W-L-S. Now, in reality, what happens is they're telescopic. One, one group of seven leads into the next group of seven, into the final group of seven. And I, I, I don't even, I, I don't want to even take the time other than to suggest to you that these outpourings of judgments are mind-boggling. Were it not for the grace of God, when he sets up the millennial kingdom, by the way, which happens at the end of these seven years, he shall set up his rule and reign. We'll talk about this next week, the second coming. But he sets up his rule and reign for a millennial period. What's millennium? A thousand years. There's an old song we used to sing. Satan will be bound a thousand years. will have no tempter then. After Jesus shall come back to earth again. That's when we come back. But that is still not the new creation and the new kingdom and the new heaven and the new earth because Armageddon waits. And the last of the thousand years of peace, Satan is released for a brief period of time from the abyss, not hell. Hell hasn't been created, but it's an abyss, which is a holding place for the false prophets and all those who've gone against Christ's word. When the rapture happens, they'll be held because there's a final tribulation judgment. Where the Bible says two, and I'll, I'll, I'll close with this. I'm just laying out some stuff today. But one of, one of the last judgments to come, when Jesus comes back to rule and reign over Jerusalem. By the way, church, remember one thing. I've said this to you many, many times. God measures everything by Israel, by Jerusalem, by the holy mount. Everything on God's clock is centered in that. And that's where he finally comes back to set up his kingdom and to rule and reign forever and will be with him. But in that last judgment, the Bible says Revelation talks about a 200 million man army. That's China. That exists right now. They have that military power right now. I, I don't know... I, I, I'm, I'm going to venture something that, that it's okay. You can disagree with me or not, but China is not our friend. China owns us. We are $30 trillion in debt. We can't even pay the interest on that. And China owns a great part of that. We have sold our souls to people and a nation that does not believe in our God. But they already have a 200 million man army that marches across, and, and by the way, we'll, we'll talk about this next week, Lord willing, I'll try to get to this. But in these seven judgments, seven and seven and seven, in the last seven, they parallel the plagues of Egypt. One of the reasons we know is because the Euphrates River is dried up. The Bible says the, the whole Euphrates, from north to south, it empties into the Dead Sea. It's, a, it's, it's, one of, it's been one of Israel's protectors since its founding. But that river Euphrates to the east of Jerusalem dries up, and that 200 million man army marches over. Like Moses and the two million with him marched across dry waters, dry bed. And they come to overthrow Jesus and those who have been martyred, and those 144,000 in Jerusalem, in Israel, out 12,000 out of each tribe that have come to him by faith. And the two witnesses that come and appear out of nowhere, Moses and Elijah, most believe, three and a half days, I told you, they're killed, lie on the street, every eye shall see them because of technology today. Couldn't say this 10, 20 years ago. We can say it today. Every eye will see them lying in the street three and a half days. God raises them up. See, mm. 
one of the, one of the, one of the erroneous teachings that that I have to admit came out of my early childhood was that when the church was raptured, the Holy Spirit was taken out. Well, that's not true. The Holy Spirit is God. God is omnipresent. No one could get saved in the tribulation without the Holy Spirit because no man comes to the Father except the Spirit draw him. So the 144,000 that are redeemed in Israel in the period of tribulation before the Lord comes back have to be drawn by the Spirit because the Spirit is still here. God in mercy is still saying, I'm giving you an opportunity because I don't want you to be lost. We're not going to be given that opportunity. We're going to give an account of God either by death or by the rapture. The books will be opened. And if our name is not in the book of life, he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because there are two judgments. There's a Bema seat judgment for believers. There's the great white throne judgment at the end of, of Revelation for unbelievers. We're going to be rewarded for our works. Oh, I, I'm just getting started, but let me wind it up with this. What you're doing here on earth, what you're doing for God here, every cup of cold water given in his name will not go unrewarded. As I was in my office early this morning, I was going through some of this, and the Holy Spirit just put in my mind that it's a relatively simple illustration, and, and I, I will try to do a wrap with this. But uh, the, 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 when this thought be, became flesh and blood and, and, and just grabbed my spirit, and, and I heard the Lord saying, he said, you know, people today in, in the 20th century and early 21st century would say, Billy Graham's the greatest Christian that ever lived. I'm not detracting anything from Billy Graham, but how do we know that? We don't know that. Because the Bible says the last shall be first. The illustration the Lord put in my mind was Nate Saint. Some of you would recognize that name. He was a missionary to the Aka Indians who gave his life to those Aka Indians back in the early 50s. And years later, his wife Rachel went back and led them all to Christ. I don't know how far up the line Nate Saint will be or where Billy Graham will be or where I'll be at the end of the line somewhere. But I know this, whatever we do here for God will not go unrewarded. Even a cup of cold water. We're not living to gain his approval by good works, but we are living to invest in our works here that will be rewarded in heaven. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you. I, uh, I'm a little wound up today because I know we're going up. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. I, I pray everybody in this building today is ready and everyone that's watching today or sometime this week is ready. But if they're not, God, you're giving us a time of mercy right now. Before these judgments are poured out, before you come back to take away your bride, in the rapture of believers, God, you're still saying, my arms are open. If you'll confess your sins and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And your name is in the Lamb's book of life. And you don't need to fear standing before God. You're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. And all the church said, amen. God bless you. Go in peace.